confusing figure, this figure right here. Um, I don't want you to worry too much about this figure right here. I've only talked so far about minus 10 and minus 35 sequences, and for our purposes, that's all we're going to really be concerned about in bacterial promoters. Okay? So minus 10 and minus 35 sequences. There are other sequences that can affect transcription, and we're not going to talk about those. Okay. Um, now, what I want to do, okay, so what I've talked about so far is, is a, a set of general ways in which transcription can occur. So we saw in these general ways that the structure or the sequence of the minus 10 sequence can affect the efficiency with which the RNA polymerase binds. So that's a variable. What I want to tar turn our attention to in just a minute is to talk about a specific set of genes and how they're controlled. So before I do that, Lynette. So the factor independent method and the factor dependent method are both referring to prokaryotes. That's correct. E. coli. Okay. Well, let's look at a specific set of genes because it turns out that cells have very specific sets of needs. I'll give you an example. Let's imagine that I am uh, that E. coli uh, swimming around in uh, one of your guts. Okay? And the E. coli is in this fairly rich environment because you're eating all the time. And maybe you're drinking a Coke, and you get plenty of, plenty of glucose, plenty of fructose, and the E. coli is sitting there, and it's fairly happy, right? And then you decide, well, OK, I uh, am going to watch my weight, so I'm not going to eat lunch today. And so not only do you get, no, you're shaking your head, no. Not only do you get hungry, but the E. coli is getting hungry as well, all right? You get about halfway into the afternoon, and you're thinking, man, i got to have something. Okay? So you go, and you grab yourself a carton of milk. All right? How many of you have ever done this? You've done this, right? A carton of milk's good. You're feeling hungry. You want to grab a carton of milk. So you drink this carton of milk. Well, you've been drinking. The, the E. coli has gotten used to drinking Coke all the time. It's full of sucrose. It's full of fructose. And now you're hitting it with a new sugar. The sugar of milk is called lactose. All right? Well, this E. coli really needs to change its attitudes. It needs to change what it's willing to break down. When you're drinking Coke, it's automatically making all the things to break down glucose because that's the most common sugar that's out there. Lactose, on the other hand, which is composed of glucose and galactose, okay, it can't handle unless it has enzymes that allow it to handle lactose. So the E. coli cell has a way of responding to lactose that has nothing to do with the sequence of the promoters or, any, or sigma factors or any of that. So this involves another system, a specific system, and I'm going to tell you about that. So you understand what the cell's trying to do. It's trying, now we've got a new food, we're going to try to figure out how to use this new food. Okay, well, this, um, this new food, lactose, uh, for the cell to metabolize, it requires the action of three genes. Okay. Three, three genes, and we're only going to really talk about two of them. Okay? Bacteria have an unusual organization of genes that our cells don't have. Okay? In a lot of ways, bacteria are a lot more efficient than we are in their use of genes, and I'll explain why. The bacteria have multiple genes for related functions located close together. We don't have that. If we had three genes that were necessary to metabolize lactose, which we do, we would find that one might be on chromosome 12, one might be on chromosome 21, one might be on chromosome 4. Completely different regions. They're not linked. They're not close to each other. In E. coli, we find the three genes for lactose, bang, 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 right next to each other on the same chromosome. In fact, they're located that way so the E. coli cell can make one messenger RNA that contains all three. One messenger RNA contains all three. This actually simplifies the process for the E. coli cell because now it only has to have one promoter. When you turn on that promoter, all three genes are made. Simple, efficient. So when we have multiple genes, under the control of a single promoter, we have something called an operon, O-P-E-R-O-N. Operons are found only in prokaryotes. They're not found in eukaryotes. 
So I'm going to give you the definition again. An operon is a set of genes under the control of a single promoter. That means that all of those genes will appear on the same messenger RNA. Okay. Now we're going to talk about how this operon is controlled. Because if we understand that promoter, we understand how the expression of all three genes is controlled simultaneously. This operon is called the LAC operon, LAC standing for lactose, and operon, of course, standing for operon. Let's see what it looks like. Oops. What did I just do? Okay. All right. This is a schematic diagram now of the LAC operon. We're looking at a schematic figure of the DNA. We see the plus one region, and the plus one is, of course, where the first nucleotide is going to be made into the messenger RNA. When we look at this, we discover that there are some binding sites for three different proteins, only one of which is RNA polymerase. Okay? So RNA polymerase would like to bind very much between about minus 48 and plus 5. That's the place that RNA polymerase says, if that's open, I'm going to go bind there. There's also a binding site for a protein called the repressor. You see the repressor also called the LAC repressor. That's what it's most commonly called, the LAC repressor. Notice that the place that the LAC repressor wants to bind overlaps with the place that the RNA polymerase wants to bind. Okay, and that'll become important in a minute. So the LAC repressor wants to bind to the exact same place, that the, or not the exact same place, but they overlap with the place that the RNA polymerase wants to bind. The third protein out here is called CAP. And CAP would like to bind ahead of where the RNA polymerase wants to bind, but it doesn't overlap with it really. Okay? So CAP out here, RNA polymerase here, repressor bound up here. Everybody got that sort of pictured in your head now? As the name would suggest, the repressor is a protein that represses transcription. When the repressor is bound to the DNA, RNA polymerase cannot bind, and transcription will not occur. That's pretty straightforward, right? We'll talk about CAP later. First, I want to talk about the repressor. So when the repressor is bound to the DNA, that happens. Well, how do we know when the repressor is bound to the DNA? It's actually fairly straightforward. First of all, E. coli cells always have a small amount of repressor protein in them. They always have a small amount of repressor protein. Do you have a question? No, why? How do that? Well, maybe we'll see. <laughs> His question was why, and I said maybe we'll see. All right, so why is always a good question to ask, by the way. Don't ever hesitate to ask why. All right, now. So I'm hopefully, hopefully going to answer this question about why this happens in a second. So it's got a repressor. It's stopping transcription. One of the reasons why it might not want to, that the cell might want to have a repressor, would be to keep the cell from synthesizing this messenger RNA when there's no lactose present. Because that would be wasting energy. Right? So here's a way of controlling whether or not transcription is going to occur by simply blocking the promoter. This is not an uncommon mechanism. Well, that's fine and dandy, but how in the world do I get the repressor off of there if there's always a little bit of repressor in the cell? It turns out the cell has a very cool setup. The repressor is able to bind to the sugar lactose. Now, I'll let you tell me what happens when the sugar binds to lactose. What do you suppose happens? What's that? Uh, better than peels off, it, when, it, when, the shirt, when the repressor binds to lactose, it can no longer bind to DNA. So the signal to the cell is, hey, lactose is present. Wouldn't it be nice to turn on the gene? So it binds to the repressor, and now the repressor is no longer stopping transcription from happening. Kind of cool, huh? Make sense? Does that make sense to your why question? Yeah, it does. Okay, <laughs> good. Everybody got that? 
It's a very, very simple system. I haven't told you what CAP does yet. It's, it's even cooler. Maybe not cooler, but it's cool too. Yes? No, no. I'm saying that when repressor binds lactose, it can't bind there. It can't go there. So lactose binds the same site that this would use to bind to, to DNA. Is the repressor ever there first? Well, the repressor may get there first, but this is not a covalent interaction. And so when we don't have a covalent interaction, we always think about things can go on and off and on and off. So if when it comes off, lactose is present, bang, it's not going to go back on. Now, this therefore lets this be open. Now RNA polymerase can come in and bind. That's cool, right? Well, now here's another added hook. It turns out that the Tata box for the LAC operon isn't a very good Tata box. What happens when we have something that's not a very good Tata box? The efficiency of binding is low, right? So if we had nothing else here, what would happen was we get a little bit of transcription, we get a little bit of this operon being made, but not very much. This is where CAP comes into play. CAP helps the RNA polymerase to bind. So when CAP is bound, it helps RNA polymerase to bind. But what if CAP binds and the repressor binds? What do you suppose is going to happen? It's not a trick question, I hope. Only two choices. RNA polymerase is going to bind or not bind? How many say will bind? How many say won't bind? Okay, Because you're right, the repressor wins. It covers up that site. There's nothing that the cap can do to make it go on. That's not uncommonly what happens. Now, cap also binds to something interesting as well. Okay? Cap binds to a molecule called cyclic AMP. When cap binds to cyclic AMP, cap can bind to the binding site. When cap is not bound to cyclic AMP, cap cannot bind to the binding site. It has nothing to do with the repressor, so it's independent of the repressor. So when cyclic AMP is bound, cap is going to be bound here whether or not the repressor is present. If the repressor is present, the repressor is going to win. So if I were to ask you on an exam when you would get the maximum amount of transcription in the cell, what would you say would be present for the lac operon? The maximum amount of transcription. Lactose and cyclic AMP, right? Because lactose to get the to make sure the repressor is not on there, and cyclic AMP to make sure cap is on there. That's going to give you the maximum amount of expression of this of this uh, uh, operon. That makes sense. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what's happening. Yes, sir. Um, so this depends on how much lactose is present, whether there's a certain percentage of the repressor that's bound versus not bound, or is it usually okay. Yeah, good question. Does it matter how much lactose is present? And in general, it doesn't significantly. All right? I've also get, told you a little bit of a lie to keep things simple. Okay? It's not technically lactose that it binds to. It's a molecule called allolactose. But in this class, we'll keep it simple. We'll call it lactose. That's fine. The most important thing is the principle, not so much the name. You get the idea about what's happening, right? Yes, ma'am. So I'm just wondering where the cyclic AMP comes from. Is that independent of the Very good question. Where does the cyclic AMP come from? Um, I bring it up here because we're going to talk about cyclic AMP later in the term. Cyclic AMP is a molecule used by many cells for a phenomenon called signaling. Oh, okay. And so this is a signal that we need something. This is a signal that maybe there's something that needs to happen so we can make the, bring this about. So in this case, it's signaling, hey, let's turn on the LAC repressor. Okay. Or turn on, or turn on the LAC operon. Sorry, turn on the LAC operon. It was a question back here. Um, did you have a question? Sure. You didn't have a question? Okay.